Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Work-Related Musculoskeletal Disorders in Sonographers, A Look Back and a Path to Progress, presented by the WRMSD Grand Challenge Alliance. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing and Communications at IAC. This webinar is a joint presentation of the eight member organizations of the WRMSD Grand Challenge Alliance. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Youssef Saeed. Dr. Saeed is a master educator of musculoskeletal medicine. He is the director of pain medicine and functional rehabilitation and the interventional pain medicine director for the United States Department of Defense Intrepid Spirit Center at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. He is also assistant professor of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences a true expert in the field, and we are happy to have him with us today. Also joining us today from the WRMSD Grand Challenge Alliance is Dale Sear, CEO and Executive Director of Intellios, to share a few words with us about the Alliance. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to Dale Sear. Dale? Thank you very much, and I want to welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where you are in the world. And I also personally, before we get underway, I want to thank you for being in the healthcare profession and contributing to public health during this crisis. A couple of years ago, ARDMS brought together the leaders of the sonography community to discuss topics that were affecting sonography. And the number one unanimous issue that came up was work-related musculoskeletal disorders in sonography. And the point of the group was to decide to really buckle down and try to do something about it by really eliminating the problem. And this was going to be based on building on the great work and research that has been done in the past. From this effort, we have developed a grand challenge model, which is really a methodology that looks at uh, very large problems and to see how we can move along in a very methodical and scientific manner to address work-related musculoskeletal uh, disorders. From that, uh, last September, we had a, a, an initial meeting of the Grand Challenge in work-related musculoskeletal design, in which uh, invited uh, people, about uh, 50 people came together to discuss how, we, how was this group going to move forward to eliminate work-related musculoskeletal disorders in sonography. Some methodology and projects and programs have been put forward, namely, uh, information out to the sonography community, which has led to this uh, webinar that we're going to be hearing today from one of the leading experts in musculoskeletal uh, disorders. In the future, you'll be hearing more from this alliance of the sonography community, and uh, we look forward to uh, having a great presentation today, learning a lot, and moving on to next steps to eliminate work-related musculoskeletal disorders. On that, again, I thank you for participating during this very busy time for all of you in healthcare, and I will turn it back over. Great. Thank you so much, Dale. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us, especially in, in light of uh, everything that's going on uh, in the world uh, and, and most likely locally for you as well. Um, we certainly appreciate your, your, your making the time to uh, to listen and, and watch this webinar. Uh, you know, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, just make you aware of some resources that many of the uh, sonography societies, both provider and sonographer level uh, societies have made available. You can click on those uh, to the left of your, of your screen under the resources tab. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of good documentation on, on uh, how to uh, both utilize the appropriate sterility uh, uh, ways to keep your transducers, your ultrasound machine sterile uh, in light of COVID-19. In addition, uh, you, you know, you can certainly look at the Centers for Disease Control uh, NIOSH websites on how to don and doff PPE. Uh, those resources are, are uh, still very accurate and, and, uh, and appreciable, and especially in, in this moment in time. Uh, so I would, uh, you know, make sure that you're making the time to don and doff your PPE appropriately. Uh, you know, uh, if your employer uh, does not have resources or uh, the capability to provide you PPE, 
uh, you should, you know, certainly uh, question that, uh, you know, reach out to your federal resources, including the Department of Labor, OSHA, which I will talk about later today, as well as the CDC NIOSH uh, for help in those areas. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the aspects of the regulatory pathway uh, in light of this uh, kind of catastrophic moment for us. Um, you know, before we get started, I just, I want to talk uh, briefly also about the objectives of today's webinar. Uh, they're really threefold. I want to kind of describe uh, the problems from an epidemiologic uh, standpoint. I, I want to talk about the clinical pathology that we see, uh, you know, from the, from the medical standpoint. And then, uh, and lastly, I, I just want to talk about uh, what you individually can do about it uh, on a personal level, but also, uh, you know, what we can do as a group, as an alliance, uh, uh, to help uh, promote our specialty uh, to progress and to kind of take care of this uh, uh, this uh, work-related issue uh, at the very onset, and so b before things become pathology. Uh, so, with that being said, let's uh, let's get started. There's uh, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of evidence that's uh, that's already been published by some great resources in the field. Joan Baker, Sean Roll, Kevin Evans, uh, you know uh, Charlotte Henningsen at, at uh, AIUM. There there are there's a ton of publications that really have described how robust this prop this problem is within the sonographer community uh, and such. So we're not really reinventing the wheel, but uh, you know, more or less shedding light on on what the current problem is and how and ways that we can act together, join together uh, to be able to uh, address the issue. Uh, you know, within this year or the next year, certainly. So you know, this is the 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 common model for uh, for folks to receive repetitive motion injuries, and it's it's fairly straightforward. I mean, this is uh, this has been published in the literature. For a very long time, it, it the insult to the tissues is really uh, uh, directly correlated to the number of repetitions, the force per each repetition, and inversely uh, proportional to the amplitude and the relaxation. So when we talk about scan times, duration between scans, all of those factors kind of come into play when we talk about insults and injuries to uh, to to ourselves, basically. So in terms of some of that background literature, and, and many of you that are on the call probably already know this, but musculoskeletal injuries are, are the most prevalent uh, cause of injury in sonographers. Uh, those, those, the range in prevalence has been about 80 to 90% within a career of each sonographer. And uh, interestingly, which is a much higher level than any other uh, than any other specialty within healthcare, other than maybe perhaps uh, hands-on CNAs and, and nurses, but 20% uh, of sonographers eventually uh, experience a career-ending injury. Those career-ending injuries generally occur within the first five years of employment. Uh, a, a lot of chronic pain and chronic musculoskeletal injury uh, will occur due to microtrauma, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So shoulder pain is the most common complaint, followed by neck pain, uh, and again, those seasoned sonographers will see repetitive motion injuries in, from the wrist, the hand, the low back, and the fingers. 57% uh, of sonographers empirically have uh, failed to report their symptoms. So that's probably one of the largest uh, problems within the sonographer community is uh, transparency and reporting of the issue. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that uh, and legitimate reasons. Uh, you know, certainly sonographers when they report injuries, they're they're scared to lose their job, and that's probably uh, the the largest reason why sonographers don't report their injuries. Uh, and it's not just in the sonographers, but also in the providers. Ultrasound fellows uh, that we we sampled recently, uh, they don't report their symptoms either to their program director. So this is uh, not a very uncommon uh, you know ways to report, and th that's true within he the healthcare industry overall. Uh, uh, folks are afraid to report healthcare related injuries, uh, you know, for fear of stigma and, and other reasons related to employment. So when we when we go back and look at some of the Bureau, the Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, uh, it really indicates that diagnostic medical sonographers have about 16 
0.3 days away from work per 10,000 full-time workers. Uh, it also indicates that about 19.4 days away from work for every 10,000 workers due to the due to just pure purely in positioning of the sonographer. So that data is about six years old, four to six years old, and I'll, I'll uh, also update some of this as we kind of move forward. In 2016, just to kind of get into the more nuanced data, now these are the BLS data, this is just reported injuries, right? And so many of us that don't report the injuries uh, don't show up in these numbers. And so that's why uh, many of us have always thought that the sonographer work injury problem is much more robust uh, than what, uh, what both the Department of Labor, uh, both within the specialty organizations, uh, you know, and, and many, much of it has to do with some of those, uh, those cultural issues that we talked about earlier. But 310 lost work time days. What's more important, I want you to look at the bottom of the screen where 29% of those injuries actually resulted in high levels of work loss. So 11 to 29 days uh, at 29%, and again, 31 days or more. So the vast majority of injuries actually result in a lo lost work time that is actually considered a major lost work time. So the median day away from work was about 13 days. So also in, in some of the 2016 day, uh, data, uh, in terms of the purely lost work time, this is it kind of uh, shown by body parts. So shoulder, arms, hands, and back uh, for the most part. In, in 2014, between 2016, the lost work time cases were actually fairly constant. There was an increase in lost work time more recently in 2018. And the data is, you know, that's the most recent data that we have, the 2018 data. And so we're going to track this to see if that, that continues to increase as a trend. But uh, until we receive the 2019 data, this is the best that we have. So interesting also in the 2018 data, uh, it actually correlates to a high level of lost work time per case relative to other similar industries within healthcare. So when we talk about direct costs and disability in the, in the uh, U.S. workforce, as you can see, overexertion involving an outside source is, is, the, is the biggest cost in terms of billions of dollars. And when you add the first column with the last column in, into overexertion, i.e. repetitive motion, and also repetitive motion for microtrauma, you can imagine the cost in billions of dollars. Uh, and actually, it's been reported about 20 to $25 billion uh, of cost, both and that's just purely the direct cost. When we talk about indirect costs, uh, i.e. job retraining, i.e. Um, uh, absenteeism, presenteeism, uh, those will actually propel that, uh, that number much more uh, higher than, than, than what we can quantify in our direct costs. So many of the risk factors we've known for a long time, and it's generally awkward posture, right? And so, uh, you know, we're, we're always looking for the best scan possible. And this is more challenging because at least in the sonographer community, uh, in school, th there is a, uh, a course uh, as part of the curriculum, not necessarily a course, but part of the curriculum on, on ergonomics and ergonomic design, redesign, and having the ability to change a workstation. That currently is not part of uh, a fellowship training for many of the ultrasound uh, providers, i.e. physician level providers uh, currently. But I, I suspect that will change as more and more providers start to suffer more and more of these repetitive uh, motion injuries. So again, the, the risk factor is repetitive movement. So those include shoulder flexion and abduction or, uh, and also extension uh, of the elbow and wrist pinch grips, wrist flexion and extension, and uh, basically where the, uh, where the monitor is placed on your screen. Many of you already know this. I'll just uh, kind of show you some examples in a few minutes. Also more on risk factors, there's one-sided static work. So if you're always scanning on the right, on the right side, that puts your right side at risk. So it, it, when you're holding the transducer in that pinch grip and, uh, and you have your shoulder abducted with the elbow extended, that puts uh, uh, quite a bit of pressure on the, on the cervical spine, uh, and so it leads to a lot of uh, cervical spine disorders. In addition, scanning obese patients, as you know, when we have to reach across patients, that's when we're most abducted and extended, uh, which also predisposes to injury. When you 
are uh, abducted and extended, and also you're turned to the opposite side of the patient in terms of your neck rotation, that also predisposes probably, uh, if, if you could quantify the risk, that would probably be the number risk, uh, the number one risk, I should say. <clears throat> Some other uh, interesting uh, risk factors when it comes to repetitive motion, uh, night shifts uh, are also considered a risk factor. And this isn't, this isn't really new to healthcare, right? And so when we talk about night shift workers in general, night shift workers suffer, uh, suffer more injuries on the job, have uh, uh, worse metabolic outcomes, i.e. they suffer uh, cardiac disease, they have higher rates of CVA and MI, et cetera, et cetera. And that's purely from working at night. Uh, when you perform more than 100 scans uh, a month, when you have 13 or more hours per day on shift, which uh, some of you may be facing in, in this type of situation, uh, we're, we're really being called on uh, to work outside of our normal work paradigm. And so uh, it may predispose you to more work injuries than, than what you were previously exposed to previously. So if you don't have rest between your shifts, it also predisposes your injuries to injuries. If you have long scan times, if you're doing bedside ultrasound, and the rationale for that is, is you don't have the time to ergonomically design, redesign your room so that you can scan appropriately. And also if you have some underlying degenerative joint disorder. So this is an example uh, in the picture. You can see that contralateral neck rotation, that shoulder is abducted. Uh, it doesn't look like that elbow is extended, but this is not a, uh, a risk-free scanning pattern. So uh, it, you know, with, with today's ultrasound images, they're uh, uh, basically on gantries. You can move the, the screen uh, towards the patient. So you, the image is right in front of you. So your neck is not turned. Uh, but when we talk about musculoskeletal disorders, it's really a cumulative trauma disorder. They really de develop over time uh, from some of these, what we consider micro tears in the anatomy. Uh, so when we try to quantify those direct costs, again, uh, it's been reported about $20 billion in direct costs, but the indirect cost is really what people uh, in businesses are really looking towards nowadays because uh, you know when you have to bring uh, a, a temp employee in, you lose revenue, they may not know your scanning protocols, both absenteeism, presenteeism, the time it takes to train uh, new sonographers, those really encompass the indirect costs. And uh, when you talk about the direct costs, of course, it's uh, uh, costs that really emanate from workers' compensation, from pe personal health insurance, and, uh, and from employees just not being able, able to perform the jobs anymore at all, i.e. an impairment uh, which leads to a disability. So interestingly, empirically, the first really published musculoskeletal disorder in sonography was uh, by Crane in '85. So this is not a new this is not a new concept. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, publications, both in '97, 2009, more recently, that uh, really have have talked about the the, the problem at, qu at quite a great length. But uh, for some reason, we're still seeing uh, the same the same injury pattern, perhaps to even more levels now, as, as volume, uh, volume has increased, we, we need to have more scans to, uh, you know, for, for kind of the, the business model uh, without time between scans. And so that all, that all of those factors predispose to higher rates of work injury. Uh, so again, some of that, the pinch grip, that micro, the turning of the, of the uh, hand, both in radial and ulnar deviation, flexion and extension of the wrist, uh, the contralateral turn of the neck, those are all depicted in these, in these pictures uh, that uh, are really based on some of the, uh, the literature that's been published. So when we talk about specific pathology, what we're really talking about when it comes to the number one disorder is the shoulder. And so what we see are basically rotator cuff tendinopathies, and they include both the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, the teres minor, minor and, as well as the subscapularis. What I see most often clinically is really an impingement syndrome, and that's probably due to repetitive microtrauma. And so when we look at the spine pathology, we see many of the injuries involve the facet joints, they are, uh, and they can and cannot encompass some of the disc disorders. And so cervical 
uh, spondylosis, cervical spondylosthesis, uh, cervical radiculopathy, and cord compression uh, are fairly common, as well as degenerative disc disease, which pre predisposes you to all of those, uh, those pathologies that I talked about earlier. And so this is what it looks like under, under x-ray. I know this is an ultrasound talk, but uh, unfortunately you can't see the bone pathology the way you can under x-ray. And so yeah, obviously poor ergonomics stresses these joints. Uh, it probably induces uh, high levels of degenerative joint disorder, uh, probably for micro trauma and repetitive motion, uh, especially if you're not scanning in ergonomic patterns. And so those facet joints give you referred pain patterns across the shoulder, across the neck, into the occiput as well. And so oftentimes sonographers, uh, you know, they may feel pain in their shoulder, but it's actually a facet joint mediated disease. And so, uh, or there could be some uh, combination of diseases. And we often see uh, uh, combined injury patterns most often as well. They always run in twos generally. So again, this is just an image of what a cervical uh, disc herniation would look like. You can see that disc is out, it's herniated uh, against the nerve root. And so oftentimes uh, sonographers will complain of pain, weakness, uh, paresthesia uh, in the shoulder and down the arm as well. When we talk about the hand and wrist pathology, what we're really talking about is uh, the flexor, the common wrist flexor, the common wrist extensor, tenosynovitis, which uh, may or may not uh, have wrist, purely wrist pathology, but also elbow pathology. And so we can also see de Quer veins, carpal tunnel, and carpal metacarpal joint arthritis as well. Uh, when we talk about the elbow, you can see that arrow on the right that points to the elbow, depending on if you're wearing uh, 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 elbow pads or not, that may help you to reduce uh, your ulnar nerve entrapment, uh, especially if you're scanning uh, on, a, uh, on a chair with an arm on it so that your elbow is rested against the pad. Uh, that may help to uh, ameliorate some of those diseases. So uh, ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow ends up giving you weakness in the owner distribution. Uh, you may or may not have a tenel sign, but certainly elbow pads uh, will help that. If you, know, if, you, know, you use an injection by, uh, by ultrasound guidance to inject the owner nerve, that may help reduce the inflammation in the area, but ultimately you may need a surgical decompression of that owner nerve or a, a translocation, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, it's just one of those procedures that if we can prevent the disease, it, it's much more that much better than uh, treating the disease. So again, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, common wrist extensor tendonitis, common wrist flexor tendonitis. The old terms are the epicondylitis, but we generally don't use those anymore. Um, uh, the ways to treat those types of disease processes are rest, counterforce braces, uh, you know, of course, doing physical therapy and ultimately a steroid injection or a regenerative medicine injection, actually. So uh, what Dequer veins is, it's really a, a repetitive microtrauma uh, against the extensor pollicis brevis and the uh, abductor pollicis longus. Uh, and, and the ways to treat that, uh, that thumb pathology is, is to uh, treat it with a spica splint. Uh, certainly you can do eccentric exercises from a physical therapy standpoint, as well as inject it with steroids uh, for refractory pathology or, and or regenerative medicine procedures. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common entrapment neuropathy. It affects women greater than men. It's really a, a compression neuropathy and or attraction neuropathy. Uh, the best literature today really indicates that it's the common wrist flexor hypertrophy that, uh, that causes the median nerve to, uh, uh, to be compressed as it travels through the tunnel. Uh, and eventually it, it, it gives you paresthesias in digits uh, three, four, and five, uh, I'm sorry, in digits one and two, uh, rather. Uh, and the best way to treat that is, uh, is therapy. Uh, you can certainly do steroid injections or hydrodissection under ultrasound, as well as, uh, as, well as surgery as well. Carpal metacarpal arthritis is, a, is another pathology that we see in sonographers, and, and it's really uh, uh, when the cartilage between the joints from a lot of the repetitive micro trauma from those fine movements eventually erodes, uh, you know, perhaps you have an inflammatory arthritis as a secondary symptom as well, but uh, it, it often will, will occur in sonographers at the first digit, the, uh, 
the trapeziometacarpal OA is where we see it most often. Uh, and it certainly it will affect your range of motion. It will affect your grip. This is a gradual process. All of these generally occur over time. And so splinting, again, steroids, regenerative medicine procedures, both physical therapy, all help to, all help to curtail some of the symptoms that you may be experiencing. So some of the uh, clinical observations that, that we see really is the rotator cuff injuries, including the tendinosis, the bursitis, the, the tears, partial tears, full thickness tears, and the impingement syndrome are the classic disorders that we see in, uh, in sonographers and providers that utilize ultrasound, uh, but certainly cervical neck strains, both the tendinosis and in the cervical strap muscles, the facet joint arthropathy and the degenerative disc disease uh, with or without uh, radiculopathy. Certainly when you have annular tears, you can have discogenic pain as well that, that really can seem like facet joint pathology, but is more of a disc disease as well. So, uh, you know, interestingly, when, when, so the, w- w- which we don't really talk about, we talk about these, uh, these upper extremity disorders, but sonographers also suffer from low back disorders as well. And the reason for that is generally sonographers are leaning forward when they're scanning, and their arms are abducted and their uh, wrists are extended, their elbows are extended. So when you're, when you're bent forward, you have the highest amount of disc pressure in the lumbar spine. And so uh, it, it's very common for sonographers due to that, uh, due to that forward, uh, uh, forward flexion of the torso and the thighs, uh, it, it predisposes you to a lot of lumbosacral pathology. And so really having, uh, there was a question that I saw very early on, an ergonomically designed chair with a lumbar pad uh, is probably the best chair. So you're seated back into a, in a, into a lumbar extension uh, where the disc pressure is probably the lowest. And so having that capability, although I, I don't really go into manufacturers because this is uh, continuing education, but there are many manufacturers that have ergonomically designed chairs that, uh, you know, you can you literally can get them on Amazon. Um, as well as uh, some of the other more common pathologies that we see outside of that beginning five-year mark. And so many of the repetitive motion, the, you know, the elbow pathologies, the wrist pathologies, we see that in our sonographers that are well-seasoned. So anybody greater than five years is when we start to see these hand and wrist pathologies more and more. So when, we, when it comes to, so now we're going to kind of talk about the path forward and, uh, and hopefully we'll have a robust discussion on, on what really needs to be done. So certainly uh, with the grand challenge, we, we're, we're trying to educate our sonographers. Uh, the community is well aware of the issues. So the education may not be relevant within our community, but perhaps the education needs to occur outside of our community. So engaging with uh, with other associations, engaging with the medical community as a whole, as well as the regulatory agencies, is where the education probably needs to occur uh, first and foremost. Uh, sonographers, there has to be uh, transparency in reporting, and so uh, uh, you know both sonographers should feel uh, comfortable in reporting their injuries to their employers, uh, and the employers should be forward-thinking enough to recognize that these injury patterns occur, and so. Uh, you know, perhaps there needs to be some oversight, both from a personal level as well as a supervisory level uh, in, in terms of recognizing that, uh, yes, my, my employees do have a, a risk of, of being injured and I have to be very in tune to that as an employer if I, if I hope to keep these fantastic employees around. And so there obviously is an individual role in, in extending your, your personal career. You don't want to enter sonography and then be out of it as quickly as you entered it. And so, uh, you know, certainly taking the, the personal initiative uh, to, to take the time to organize your room uh, uh, and, uh, and advocate for yourself. And obviously, uh, you know, it, it's much greater than an individual and an employer level, but it really needs to be a, a change in culture. So there are all sorts of, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, controls, there are uh, all sorts of ways to control for hazards. And, and some of the controls uh, we, we all fairly know about. Uh, it includes 
job, roti- ro- job rotation, frequent rest breaks or frequent rest cycles uh, between scans. Perhaps you scan for 45 minutes, you take a five minute break uh, and or uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some amount of rest work cycle uh, uh, that's been studied in the literature as well. And limiting the number of number and types of scans. So if, if you're doing OB scans all day, that probably predisposes you to a lot of pathology because there certainly is a lot of wrist uh, microflexion and extension while you're trying to obtain uh, the best images. And so having time to ergonomically reset the room is another administrative control that employers can uh, can use to stand apart. And uh, and sometimes you may need two sonographers in the room with each patient. And, uh, you know, if, if one sonographer is scanning, perhaps the other sonographer is measuring and, uh, and taking and uh, uh, dictating the images uh, at the same time as the scan uh, to help uh, to help reduce the ergonomic burden that that sonographers face. There's all sorts of engineering controls and substitutions uh, that the manufacturers have done. Uh, they, they've, you know, obviously they've put those monitors on gantry so that you can move them around and, and uh, 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 you know, they've made carts much more accessible and, and movable. All of those types of engineering uh, redesigns and designs will help uh, with, or with ergonomic in- issues, making transducers lighter weight, I'm sorry, I spelled weight wrong there. Uh, also, having uh, uh, w- pro- possibly wireless transducers, a- as long as the uh, as long as the imaging resolution is high enough to capture the the images that we we need. The, the the last level of control that we always kind of describe in the occupational medicine uh, literature, which is probably the least effective, is the personal protective equipment. Things like cable straps, uh, ergonomic tables, ergonomic chairs, et cetera, et cetera. And so those will work uh, if they're used appropriately. And that's always the caveat when it comes to PPE. Generally, when you have PPE that's available, uh, employees tend uh, not to use it sometimes because they're uh, they when you're scanning and you're not in pain uh, is probably when the, the problems first begin to occur. So when we talk about the role of OSHA, it's really a multifactorial, multifactorial role. Uh, it, there's not really a, an ergonomic, there, well, there was an ergonomic uh, uh, standard, but that has, has not really been, been enforceable. And so uh, when it comes to uh, the regulatory environment, there certainly is the general duty clause uh, of the OSHAC, which really just says that if an employer recognizes that there's a hazard, they have a duty uh, to a duty to reduce the risk. And so, uh, OSHA has been assessing these musculoskeletal uh, work-related ergonomic issues uh, very aggressively, uh, probably uh, you know in the last uh, four to six years. In fact, poultry is probably the industry that was. Uh, the 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 biggest uh, 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 problem recently, where OSHA has uh, has uh, kind of invoked the more regulatory citations uh, to really get the industry to look at uh, many of the uh, micro trauma injuries that their employees are are facing, and so they certainly can do inspections. It, it, you can you you know having the OSHA uh, come and inspect the work site if there are a high number of OSHA recordable claims. Is probably a good thing. There's OSHA has the ability to do a work a, a worksite evaluation without issuing citations, as well as the ability to uh, to issue citations. And so, uh, you know that that is one aspect that that you can certainly look at uh, both, uh, you know, from a societal level as well as a, an individual level. And so, uh, the 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 nice thing about that is once OSHA has come out to the worksite to do an inspection, they often will. Uh, you know, have that employer on a reinspection list or an investigation after 12 months, and so uh, uh, that allows the industry to 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 be regulated in some ways. So, on an individual level, I just I want to briefly talk about workers' compensation because uh, uh, the, it's always you know, and, and it's not very special to sonographers, unfortunately, but workers' comp claims are very difficult to adjudicate and and they're litigious in nature. And so uh, when it comes to workers' compensation, you really need medical causation. So what does that mean in the context of workers' comp? It really means that the bur- the burden is on the is on the employee or the worker. So they have to be able to prove the injury uh, 
that injury has to be a medical condition and it has to have occurred at work. And so uh, that is really the three pronged approach that is very difficult to prove in a lot of these repetitive microtrauma claims. And so it's, it, and it's based on a factual versus uh, a medical evidence uh, way. And I think I skipped a couple of slides here. So when we talk about workers' uh, compensation, the, the many of the issues, so when, you, when you're at the top of the stairs and you fall down the stairs and you break your leg, it's, it's fairly evident, right? You know, maybe you're carrying a patient, you lost, the patient lost their balance, you tried to save them, you both fell down the stairs, uh, you ended up with a broken leg. It's an open and shut case, right? Uh, it happened at work, we know what the injury is, it was a fracture, um, and, uh, and uh, you need medical treatment. The problem with some of these repetitive motion injuries is that there's a lack of an inciting event. So there's not, what, there's not really a sonographer that can tell you, uh, my, shoulder, uh, my shoulder pain occurred when I did the second scan on this date. It just doesn't happen that way. It's usually a gradual process over time and years. And so, uh, and oftentimes when it comes to the insurers, there's always some contrib contribution by uh, the degenerative process in, in, uh, in normal aging. And so we know that people that are older than 40 years old tend to have joint pain. And so uh, that contribution from normal aging helps to predispose to sonographers to work injuries, perhaps at a younger age. We certainly see that in our military workforce. And so the, another issue with uh, workers' compensation is the variability from state to state. And so oftentimes sonographers, uh, whether they're job changing or rotations, the laws are different because they're all generally managed by the state. They're, these aren't uh, federal workers' comp claims unless you work for a federal employer. And so uh, not only is there variability between state workers' comp insurer, uh, uh, state workers' comp systems, but there's also variability between uh, insurers. And so uh, many times these states have privatized their workers' comp insurers. And so many insurers uh, act very differently. Uh, and so that also causes a, a lot of undue stress to individuals when, uh, when it comes to workers' compensation. So how do, how do individuals best address some of these claims? And so the, the best thing, I, and I'm trying to give you the best medical advice, I'm not an attorney, so I can't give you uh, very good legal advice, but certainly the best thing that you can do is you have to be aware of your initial symptomology. So as soon as you start to have symptoms, document it and uh, talk to your supervisor immediately. Uh, and you really should present, present to your supervisor and whoever the occupational medicine physician or musculoskeletal specialist and, and talk about the symptoms that you're facing immediately. Because the more medical documentation you have, the better, the easier the claim moves through the system. And so, you, you know, you, you can certainly go to your primary care physician, uh, but oftentimes the worker's uh, compensation system is set up that you, you probably have to go to whoever the, the employer's worker's comp specialist is. And so it de depends on the state, uh, you know, it could be a panel, it could be one particular provider that, they, that the uh, employer hires, but, you know, things that help you as you move through the claims process is keeping a log of the scans that you do and the type and duration of your scans. And when your symptoms occur during that type and duration of scan, what positions help to elicit your pain? What makes it better? What more importantly is when you take a vacation, does your pain go away? And that tells us a lot about work ergonomic work injuries because when we take you away from the exposure, then your pain gets better. Well, perhaps it's the work site or the work that you're performing that actually is causing the disease. And are there any observed clinical findings? Perhaps you have a ultrasound specialist that's imaged you uh, uh, either by MRI or ultrasound and that will help your claim as well. One thing that you can do to help ameliorate some of the disease for both yourself and your coworker is request a consultation. If you're in a large hospital uh, or, or a medium sized facility, perhaps they have an industrial hygienist or an ergonomist, and perhaps you can request a consultation and they may be proactive and help you redesign your room or give you the ability to uh, you know, modify your workstation. There's all sorts of 
uh, capability within generally within large institutions to address many of these issues. Now, you know, some of the smaller uh, employers that they, they probably won't have an ergonomist uh, employed by them, but, you know, you can certainly ask and request it in light of uh, work injury. Make sure your physician is aware of any worsening of symptoms and uh, make sure that the physician, when they receive the claim, completes the paperwork. Uh, when it comes to workers' comp insurance claims, the paperwork is extremely tedious, both for the employee, the employer, and the insurer, as well as the treating physician. So making sure things are filed timely. Always read the mail. You know, I, I hate to say this, but, uh, you know, many of the deadlines and workers' comp claims are, are so important that you have to uh, correspond back to the insurer, back to the employer, and also the, the treating physician also needs to make sure that everything is timely. And that's really how uh, you can address uh, many of the claims uh, from the administrative side, because many claims get uh, uh, really get closed because people aren't timely in their reporting. And so uh, make sure that when you send letters to the workers' comp insurers, uh, uh, that you're registering that piece of that parcel or you're sending it by certified mail so that you have a receipt of it and know your personal health history. Interestingly, as we kind of move from that part of the discussion to what we're seeing currently in providers uh, on our most recent survey, that 83% of, uh, of ultrasound fellows who are training in emergency medicine and they perform six or more scanning shifts a month reported a work-related uh, musculoskeletal complaint, where only 42% of those who perform less than six shifts per month reported similar injuries. Everybody always asks me, well, what's the number? What's the number I need to hit uh, to start to see pathology? And it's probably not one number for everyone, right? There's probably some individual variance between the data. But interestingly, 90% uh, of the fellows who perform more than 20 studies per scanning shift reported a work injury. And 53% of those with less than two studies per shift also reported a similar, similar injury pattern. So where are we going to go? And so the idea of the grand challenge is really a multifaceted approach to, to address this multifaceted problem. So, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of survey data, but what we really need is either one of two things, a large prospectively followed three-arm randomized controlled trial which assesses ergonomics, diagnosis, chronicity, types of work, duration of work, types of scans, et cetera, et cetera. Or we can create a registry that, that we all self-report to and, and in the hopes that we can have enough pooled data to start making population-based uh, uh, decisions and, and, and formulate risk, uh, risk analyses. So, uh, you know, that's uh, probably from a research standpoint, that's kind of where we're where we're thinking about going, and certainly engaging our regulatory and scientific agencies, including the American College of Occupational Me Medicine, NIOSH, CDC, NIOSH, OSHA. These are all important players in helping to uh, to better advocate for the sonography com uh, community. And so, one other uh, kind of uh, avenue that that we've talked about within. Uh, the grand challenge that that Dale uh, had uh, had talked about at the beginning of this is a multi-agency approach. And so, with all of you being on this webinar, this is the probably the first step in engaging with all of you on ways that we can better treat both ourselves and our peers, our friends, and and really make this profession one that is sustainable. And uh, uh, so, we we all have to work together in in educating each other, each other. Uh, perhaps there's an aspect of, of adding uh, ergonomic initiatives to accreditation and certification. Uh, you know, perhaps there's uh, some utility in bringing uh, the regulatory agencies more involved, but there probably isn't one approach. And so we're, we probably have to look at this in a piecemeal fashion and, and start uh, doing all of these things in a stepwise process. So, uh, you know, research, education, regulation, uh, whether it's employer regulation or whether it's uh, whether it's federal regulation, all of those really uh, all of those aspects probably need to be addressed at some point. Thanks again, everyone, and a very special thanks to our guest presenter, Dr. Saeed, for his excellent presentation today. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.